As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. Happy Easter Tide. This is the second Sunday of Easter and Lent Talk number 160. And I appreciate you joining me for 160 of these Lent Talks. And uh, everyone that you listen to is a blessing to me, and I'm, I'm grateful. The lectionary readings, I want to focus on the First Peter one. And it's short enough for me to just read it to you, so let, let me... Let me do that and just relax and take in. This is the, the story of, of God. This is the story of Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance. So we got a new birth, a new hope, and an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. What an what a incredible, incredible passage. When is the finale not the finale? Well, it's today. This is season 20, I mean, season 1993 of, the, of this story that begins right here at 30... Uh, A.D. or C.E., this is the year 30, because the calendar, Jesus was actually born, the debate is whether it's 4 B.C. or 3 B.C., but he actually died then in 30 A.D., or um, the year of our Lord, or in, in for the world, it's common era now. So this is, we've had the finale of the, uh, the, the story last week with Easter, but the finale is not the finale, because... Every Sunday now it's, it is Easter. That's why we worship on the eighth day, the day after the Sabbath, which is the eighth day, which is a new beginning. This is this new hope, this new inheritance, this new birth that we're reading about here in, in, in Peter's passage here. So the finale is not the finale. This is season 1993 of the greatest story ever told. Now you'd think with this first uh, episode after the finale that this Sunday would be one of the biggest Sundays of the year, maybe even bigger than Christmas. It's actually known as Low Sunday. Um, this is when you expect the least amount of people to come to church the Sunday after. This is when the, the staff gets to preach, um, or uh, this is when you uh, schedule some kind of a visiting preacher to come in. I've done a lot of low Sundays. So. <laughs> I uh, this is the, the the Sunday low Sunday uh, that that one would think would be high Sunday, but uh, there's good reasons. I mean, why it is low Sunday, the least attended Sunday of the year. Now, in, there's a new way of uh, celebrating low Sunday, and that is to make it 
uh, Holy Humor Sunday. And I've done that before. If you look at previous Lent talks and, and preach the story sermons that are all accessible to you, we have, we have hundreds and hundreds of these uh, now in print and in video form for you. Um, th- this is um, a great way, I think, uh, to celebrate Jesus' laugh life and, and what an incredible sense of humor he had and how important laughter is. I, I have a doctoral student that, that says the church has a serious problem. And by that word, serious problem, it's a, it's a pun. And, and Jesus loves puns because the church was founded on a pun. Petra on his Petra. And for a church founded on a pun to have problems with, laugh, have problems with laughter and humor and levity is, is an embarrassment. So we do have, thank you, Nathan Nordin, for a, a, the church has a serious problem. And his problem is it's, you can be serious and not solemn. Um, that there is, there's, especially after Easter, this is the joy of the Lord has our strength. This is the, the joy of resurrection. We're to live out of this resurrection joy. There are other good reasons why it's low Sunday. And that is, Holy Week is exhausting for preachers. If you could take off any Sunday, it would be this one for, for staff. So it, it is, there is a, a good reason why. There's also something that is psychological in all of us. It's called the post-achievement syndrome. And what this is, is, and I used to experience this. I didn't know what it was. I didn't have a name for it when I was going. I study hard. I work hard for a test when I was in school, graduate school. I'd work hard to get my paper in. And once I got it in and finished, uh, finished the, the test, I get depressed. Okay. I, I go into a pit. And it's the same. You, could, you find this in the life of Jesus, what the his high and holy moment. He's at his baptism where his whole family shows up and he's told how much pleasure he brings to his father. And then he immediately gets accosted by, by Satan in the desert. He immediately goes in from a, a summit to a, to a valley, a mountaintop to a, to a valley. And, and there is this rhythm in life that, that after the pinnacle is reached and you climb to the mountaintop, then it's downhill from there. But I, I want to argue that, that we ought to rethink this, that, that low Sunday, what would low, mean for low Sunday to be, to be high Sunday? And to realize, to live out of the realization that when the biggest Easter egg in history, the cave, that Jesus was buried in, when it cracked open, it opened up doors to all sorts of new possibilities, improbabilities, uh, uh, missions impossible that we never even, ever even dreamed of. And in the light of that incredible dawning, um, the, the low Sunday could become, if we reframe it, high Sunday. Episode, this is episode 1993 in an almost 2,000-year story. And that just a little put a nudge there. What is your church going to do to celebrate the 2,000th birthday of the church in 2030? Christ is alive. <laughs> the biggest news in history We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living no matter what anybody says. We serve a risen, rising, reigning, returning Lord. Those are the real four R's. We got four R's in elementary school. Well, the four R's in in the elemental school of life. We serve a king. We serve a Lord who is risen. He, he, he continues to rise. He's rising. He is reigning, a regnant reigning, Lord. And number four, he is, is returning. The, the problem is, and maybe one of the reasons why it's low and not high, is do we really, sisters and brothers, do we really believe this? Is this just, these just pious phrases, or do we really believe this? Do we bank our lives on this? Do we bet our lives on this? Do we trust this story with our life? And I'm afraid, 
that maybe some of us are, are what can I say, functional agnostics about the resurrection? Are, are we, we mouth these phrases, but we don't live as if he's alive. We live as if he is still dead. So we're mouthing believers, but we're practicing agnostics or, or atheists. And might that be part of our problem? That once the music and all the falter all is over, we're back to normal when there can be no longer a normalcy when Jesus is alive. Now, I don't like, let me just come clean here, I don't like I'm a believer language. To talk about a follower of Jesus as a believer is not to say much. For some, are you a believer? Well, for me, I can say yes, but that, that doesn't distinguish me in any way. I mean, the Bible says the devil's a believer. The devil believes. In fact, the Bible says the demons believe and tremble. So they got some Pentecostal in them, okay? They're, they're shaking and shouting in their, in their belief. So uh, believing, just this intellectual assent to the fact of, of Jesus' resurrection. See, it's not, we talk about the season of Eastertide, but Easter isn't a season, season just, it's a fact. Easter is a reality. Not just a season, it's a reality. A 365 day a year, 24 7 reality. And faith takes us beyond just belief that, yes, this is true, as the devils and the demons already agree. It's more than belief, is what we're talking about here is more than intellectual assent to the fact that he rose from the dead and rose from the grave. It's it's a living your life on that basis. So to move from, I, I, I like believe, and I turn belief into be live. Go live with your belief. Be live. Have a living faith in the living Christ. And in this good news that we, we preach. The, the Greek word that we translate as belief, anyways, is pisti, or pistis. Uh, it literally means even more than belief. It means it means trust. Boy, do we have a trust crisis? It, who do we trust? Who can you trust? It means trust. It means loyalty. It means faith. The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. It, it, you can trust your life to to Jesus. Uh, this is the only story you can trust your life to. The, this culture says, oh, buy into my story, live my story. No, no, the only story you can trust, you can go live with in your life, is the story of, of Jesus. So do we really believe, and by, and by believe means be live, with the, with the truth? And if we did believe, be live, with the truth of resurrection, that we serve a risen, rising, reigning, returning Lord, then how would we live differently than before we, we believe, before resurrection? After the resurrection, after the egg was cracked and Jesus came out of the tomb, truth emerges beyond the realms of politics, power, violence. In other words, we're living now beyond belief. A, B, live faith. Now, how do you be live with your faith in this world where there's a hailstorm of crises, a hailstorm of convulsions, a hailstorm of everything is is coming apart at the seams. How do, you, how do we be live in a world that is rampant with, with wickedness? What do you do when, 
How do you be live in, in a world where civil society is collapsing and convulsing all around you? The mobs are no longer on, just on the streets. The mobs are online. They're on social media. All the institutions that undergird our society seem to be collapsing. Our homes, our schools, our churches, our government. So how do you live, how do you be live with resurrection faith? How do you practice resurrection under the lash of the disuniting states of America? Well, th this little book, I, I, I just got this. It's by a philosopher who's a Jesuit priest. Um, it's Robert McTeague. I've never heard of him before, and I just saw this title of this book, Christendom Lost and Found, Reflections or Meditations for a Post-Post-Christian Era. And he's dealing with the decline of, of the culture of Christendom. And he summarizes four different responses. And I'm going to add a fifth one to it, but I'm just going to list them. I'm going to develop them, but just going to list them. Um, and this is, these are some of the alternatives and possibilities for how we practice resurrection faith in a world that is coming apart. And um, it seems like the, 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 it's all, you know, the, the ceiling is coming down. The heavens are falling. You know? And one is a response uh, to circle the wagons and to go into huddle formation. And in huddle formation, you just make a tight circle and you look at one another and you just ignore what is going on out there. Uh, that, that's a, at best, a short-term strategy. The second one is build the ark. Build an ark. And this is a more long-term response. Uh, you, you know that that the, the challenges that we're facing are, are going to be um, long-term. And so you... You gather everybody into your little castle, you pull up the drawbridge, and you live your life. You kind of secede from the culture, secede from the world. Uh, Rob, uh, Rob Dreyer, the Benedict Adoption, has made this very, very popular. And, and I, I understand this. I can understand this. Um, uh, I love the little... I, I tell my kids, if you're going to fight... Um, for something. Fight like you're the third monkey on the ramp to Noah's Ark and it's starting to rain. Okay. Uh, and, but, you know, I'm not sure that the fighting ought to be to get into the Ark. Uh, I think we maybe want to be turning around and some, it's not just, you know, let's build a little Ark and build a little castle um, in in the sky or in in our little enclaves to protect us from this this heartless world out there uh, for God's all of the world because God loves that world that is so wanton and awry and askew and and wicked the the third one is is head for the hills or or uh, flee to the catacombs as somebody who grew up in mountain culture uh, we we talked about this time to head for the high heels okay head for the hills my um my help comes from the Lord. Um, this is the the great psalm to um, to head for the hills. And in this one, you, you live underground. In other words, you come up. Um, a lot of urban Appalachians they live in the world during the during the week, but in the weekends they head for the hills. And we live above ground part of the week and below ground and above ground. Uh, and underground. So there's that rhythm, above ground, underground. Um, keep your head down when you're above ground. Don't raise suspicion. But you live above and worship below. And, and there's a great tradition here. If you've ever been to the catacombs, you've seen the, the, the way in which there's a certain group uh, called fasares. They combine three functions. They were the grave diggers, they dug the graves where early Christians were buried. They were the artists and who, who created the the artwork on the walls of these of these graves. And the third 
is they presided at, at the liturgical rituals of the baptism and Lord's Supper. And, and, but it all took place underground, so they worshipped underground. They kept their heads down, didn't raise suspicion. The fourth uh, alternative is to ride forth to conquer. And this kind of a crusading mentality of, I'm going to go out there and transform this culture. I'm going to try to make a Christian culture out of this culture. Um, really? Um, um, that, that's what Jesus was about? Um, uh, how, how, do you, how do you transform a cesspool? Okay. <laughs> how do you, how do you, um, I... This whole thing that there is a, 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 that we are to make whatever the culture is a Christian culture, that, that's a whole other conversation. We're to incarnate the gospel in every culture. We're to enculturate, which means to incarnate Jesus in every culture. But is there one Christian culture? Um, or are there many different expressions of who Jesus is, depending on what that culture is? With an African Jesus, or a Chinese Jesus, or a Korean Jesus, or a, a Swedish Jesus, or... Okay. And this is, this is the fifth alternative that I, I want to... that excites me, and that is you advance. You don't ride forth to conquer, you advance. You know, you know so I don't, I don't like that word retreat. Christians don't retreat. Like the like the Marines, you always move forward from a different direction. So you never retreat. You move forward. We advance to incarnate. We are all incarnator incarnators. We are to keep moving, and just like Johnny Appleseed, wherever we are, whatever the culture is, we're to incarnate the 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 seeds of who Jesus is, the gospel seeds, in whatever the soil is and wherever we go. Now, there's something to be said for all five strategies. And I've learned something from all five strategies. And we, we need to acknowledge that for strategy number one, this is a circle of wagons, things, things are different now. Um, there's no turning back the clock, no turning back. The norm is no longer the norm, which used to be that you could assume that the, ch the Christian church had a home court advantage. Those days are gone. I mean... You say you're a Christian in some places, even in the U.S., and you will pay. There are dangers out there, and you need teamwork. You need, you need to huddle together to be able to, but you don't huddle to keep huddle. The, huddle, the game is not the huddle. Uh, you come out of the huddle. Number two, procrastination is not a strategy, and that's why the, the Noah's Ark, what we can learn from the Noah's Ark mentality is we need to take action based on the warning signals. Uh, and not just short-term action, which is what the Circle of Wagons does, but long-term action. Because we're, it's a whole new world out there um, where we do not have, where well, the crowds are not cheering for the Christians to win. We're back to the Colosseum crowds. Number three, the hills and the catacomb strategy. We, we're, Jesus calls us to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We're to love both above ground and below ground. And number four, with the ride forth to conquer. I, I want to, and this week has been a hard week because this reminds us that there are no innocent bystanders. If you are a bystander you, and you witness something, you must participate. Uh, I'm thinking about the Cash App founder, Bob Lee, in San, San Francisco, stabbed multiple times. And he careens from cars that are stopping at, are at stoplights with people in them. And he's banging on their windows and they just drive off. And then he goes to condominium doors, glass doors, and bangs on the doors for somebody to open the door to help him. And everybody just ignores him. Uh, no bystander is innocent. You must not do nothing. You must do, do something. And a bystander that looks for exits is not an innocent bystander, but a guilty bystander. What has happened to us? 
What has happened to us, church? What has happened to our, our culture? This kind of civility. Um, what is happening to us when teenagers and preteens can kill other teenagers? Um, yeah, they, they, they did it with guns, but the guns were were used by hearts that had were heartless. Uh, where, where 12 year olds can think it's all right and 16 year olds can think it's all right to kill other 16 year olds and just shoot them in the head multiple times. I mean, we do have something to say to the world, we do have something to give to the world, and we do have something to bring to the world, and that is Jesus. So we do ride forth. But I, and riding forth into this world it is not going to be an easy one. This is, this is you, you hear a lot about a new world order and all these conspiracy theories about oh, there are all these people are, I don't see a new world. I see a new world disorder. That's all I see is disorder and dissolution everywhere. The air is thick with with fog and fear. And we've lost a Christian worldview. We've lost, we've lost um, a, a, a Christian mentality. Um, we've, we've failed to engage this culture in a way in which it can understand. So, again, I'm back to the beginning. How do we practice resurrection as a, for our people, a risen Rising, reigning, returning king. Amid this hailstorm of hassles and crises and troubles and, and fears. Well, I wanted to just say, is this a great time or what? If you really believe in these four R's, if you really be live with a resurrection faith, what an exciting time to be a resurrection people. We've been, by the collapse of Christendom, we've been let out of our cages now. We're free to free range, freestyle our, our life in this world. We're not controlled or constrained by culture or by politics or by a, an established church. But we're free to be little Christ. That's literally the meaning of Christian. A little Christ. And to find out what Christ can really do if we put our faith and trust in him. Not in the instructions, not in the culture, not in the church. Not in the state. But in Christ. If we lift up Christ... That's what it means to practice resurrection. We lift up a for our Christ, risen, rising, reigning, returning. And we shine forth the glory of this risen, rising, reigning, returning Lord. I, I'm, I'm so mad at, at Stephen King who ruined that phrase, the shining. He made it into a horror story. But the real shining is the gospel shining, is the Jesus shining. It's not a horror story. It's a saving story. It's a healing story. And so to live an Easter faith is to, every day, practice resurrection by saying, every day, forsaking all others and face Christ. Face Christ every day. Put your trust in this for our Jesus. And say to Christ in that mirror, that little Christ in that mirror, forsaking all others, I pledge to you my life, my truth, my troth, my story. Let's live an Easter faith 
in this world that God loves so much, as awful and as menacing and as bewildering and as frustrating and as frightening as it is. That's the world God loves so much. That God sent God's only Son to show how much God loves it. Believe, not enough. Be live and practice resurrection daily.